All right, let's start by briefly introducing yourself and summarizing your industry education and professional background. I am Jeff Campbell with Project Control Cubed. Um, I've been in planning, cost control, and scheduling for 23 years, and I'm a planning and scheduling professional. Okay, oh, also, so we've been doing VDC since 2010, so that would be 13 years of virtual design and construction. So what is Project Control Cube, and it's what are its main areas of expertise and focus? Yeah, so we are uh, experts and specialists in 5D planning, 5D scheduling, cost control. Um, we also are a minority women-owned business. Okay, and what's your role there? Uh, my role is the director of virtual planning, so a lot of VDC stuff, Todd. Could be a little bit more specific, like perhaps an example or two of uh, what you call VDC? Yeah, so what we do is we basically are taking the uh, a 3D model that is created by a designer or multiple designers. Uh, we are linking that to both the cost and the schedule um, and creating what was would be considered a digital twin to, in today. So that's what we do. Um, and a lot of those are federated because these programs that we work with are so large that uh, they become federated, which means you're going to take multiple designs, multiple construction projects, an entire program worth of costs and schedule and combine them all into one, which really increases the situational awareness, which is, I guess is what we're here to talk about. Yes. Uh, so we are here to talk about the Echo Water project in particular. So can you give me a little bit of background on this project, including what initiated this new wastewater plant and what makes it special? Sure. Um, I guess back in 2010, Regional Sanitation District of Sacramento was issued a national discharge permit requirement that required uh, the Echo Water project, which hadn't been formed yet, to go from a secondary treatment to a tertiary treatment, which would make the water much cleaner. And the Echo Water project would be leaving the delta, will be leaving the plant, going into the delta, flowing down to the Central Valley agri agricultural um, industry, and supplying them with much cleaner water. Um, and so that was what was issued back to us in 2010. And around 2011, 2012 is when Vic Kiyotani, the program manager, was handed the project. It was, it was then titled the Echo Water Project. And then he, just, he had to take that on and figure out how he was going to build this to have a compliance permit uh, completed by May of 2023, which is this year. Uh, he had an initial budget of $2.1 billion, which you know, back in 2010 was a significant amount of money. Um, and he had a lot uh, to deliver at that time. One of his main focuses was uh, he was really concerned about the rate payers rates tripling by the time this project was completed in 2023. So he really wanted to do everything he can to reduce the rates for the rate payers and to make sure that he's meeting all his compliance and create uh, a TTF, a tertiary treatment facility, which I think it it um, handles about 135 million gallons of wastewater per day, which would be the second largest um, in, U in the U.S. and the largest west in the Mississippi. So big program um, back in 2010 or 2012 when it was awarded, um, everybody that every engineering and construction company was really wanting this project. It was a really big deal. So it was really the very best of the best in the industry going for this program. Okay, um, before I move forward a little bit, can you explain a little bit what that secondary to tertiary difference is? Yes, yeah, secondary treatment, you know, it removes um, some of the ammonia, some of the, uh, well, it's ammonia and the, the nitrogen and um, some of the bacteria. But what we're going to be doing is once we go to, to tertiary treatment, it's going to remove 99% of the ammonia 89% of the bacteria and all the finer viruses and bacteria would also be removed from that. So it's much cleaner. While, you know, back in 2010, uh, secondary treatment was pretty clean. You can think of tertiary treatment as almost drinkable, but I wouldn't say drinkable. Certainly it's great for the agricultural industry. And reuse was the key. So my research for this, I know something that seemed a little unique, something called the Echo Water Project Program Management Office. Can you tell me a little yeah. bit about that and what its role is? Yeah. So as I mentioned uh, just a few minutes ago, um, everybody, all the big engineering firms were going after this. And uh, Brown and Caldwell and HDR, two major firms, 
they put their best people on the project to uh you know to be proposed on this project and they had amazing competition um so eventually Vic Kiyotani, the program manager did award the project to Brown and Caldwell and HDR. And so they would be the project management organization who would over, would basically be the managers, the program advisors and the managers to manage the entire Echo Water project from 2012 all the way till 2023, basically over a decade. And to make sure it's being delivered and to work with the client, regional sanitation, regional sanitation district and uh, their stakeholders to make sure that uh, we're delivering what they want to deliver. Um, they brought us on Project Controls Cube to manage basically be uh, project controls and to manage the planning, scheduling and cost control on the project. So uh, we were very lucky to be uh, partnered with HDR and Brown and Caldwell and uh, the they were, they are, and they, they were the most brilliant people in our industry that uh, were working on it. So it was absolutely amazing to be working with them for over a decade and we learned just an incredible amount. But yeah, that was their role to basically uh, be the program advisor to deliver the, the Echo Water project. Um, do you think there's some, some special benefits and advantages of having a, an office like that? Yes, because what you're doing is you are setting up the planning to begin with. So how do you plan for something that has uh, so many touch points such as construction traffic? I mentioned before, reducing the rate for rate payers. Um, how many different designers are there gonna be? How many different contractors are gonna be working on the same campus? All of that needs to be centralized. And they felt that um, the planning, scheduling and cost control also needed to be centralized. Um, they were also uh, really proactive in getting a state revolving fund for the Echo Water project, which really helped reduce the tax, uh, the rate payers rates. And so that state revolving fund really um, was a very low uh, interest loan that was provided to us that Sorrel had a, a big part in, in, in securing that and managing that. Basically the advantage is you're having basically like the generals who are overlooking the entire battlefield, if you will, to make sure that everything is going according to plan and provide that situational awareness, interact with the client, interact with the operating facility. Because we have to remember the operating facility. This is a live treatment plant that was already producing secondary treatment that we had to shut down, cut over new facilities, 22 new facilities, it turned out. Uh, into the to become a tertiary treatment facility. So all that really needs to be centralized. Okay, another thing I noticed it sounded a little bit unique, perhaps because it's such a large project, is that there was an owner's computerized maintenance management system, a CMMS. Can you describe yes. that and why that is unique on this project and not in every project? Well, it is. It was called Maximo is the one that we used. Um, and I think, you know, regional sanitation is really good at you know, keeping up with technology. So I give them lots of credit for that. Uh, we added to that because we had everything as a digital twin that was a smart digital twin. We were able to add the asset management to their Maximo system. So that asset management makes them understand, visualize and, and track all of their major equipment, the um, warranties for their major equipment, the life cycle of their major equipment, all of that is, you know, at the operation and maintenance, you know, their control so that they can manage that, not just during construction, but after construction, turning over to the, you know, the, to the Echo Water Project operators to be managed forever. So um, that's what we did. We used Maxo and that's what we added to it, the asset management portion. All right, thanks. You've kind of touched on these, but I want to see if we can get these condensed a little bit into a, one question. So how many engineering firms and designers were involved in this project? How did they all work together? And what was PC3's role in the project? And specifically, what were you doing? Okay, so we had nine different designers. Uh, those designers had multiple, many of them had multiple designs for multiple construction projects. Um, they all provided their design iterations. So that would be like, um, kind of like a, 30, 60, 90, 100, but we called it, um, I think we, what we called it first, second, and third, or I can't remember, but um, so they had their individual designs. Uh, they were required to provide us a construction schedule with their design. 
they were provide they were uh, required to provide us a cost estimate for their design um, and construction. And so we manage their um, design schedule. So we manage their design costs. Um, but then when they gave us their design construction schedules, we did constructability reviews with constructability experts from HDR and Brown and Caldwell. And we did that virtually using a digital twin, which really, really assisted uh, the, the constructability experts with those two major firms. Um, so we did that. And then we, as a PMO, we planned 22 projects over uh, 11 years to make sure they were sequenced to be um, brought online in the proper time, according to the permits, but also where we can manage them not stepping over each other. So that was a major issue or major concern was to make sure that they're not getting in the way of each other. They're all on one campus. Um, so we did that during the design. Um, and then once they finished their design, it went out to bid, it was design bid build. And then we managed the construction, which would have been um, them submitting their baseline schedules, their cost for those baseline schedules, um, managing the cost that would go to the state revolving fund, also known as SRF. And then uh, reviewing that and working with the PMO to then plan the commissioning because this is an active treatment plan. So we did a federated commissioning model where we figured out how we're going to shut down certain things, operational elements of the plant so that we could cut them over to tertiary treatment. Um, all of those designers were staggered according to when we needed them and their designs went on the street according to our plan, the PMO plan. That, that that's certainly a lot in your opinion is that <clears throat> is, was that the right amount of, of firms and designers or might it have been um better had there been perhaps fewer or more or was that just what was needed for this project and that's just the way it worked out we did receive uh several um several bids on on the designs i think we, we have to consider is that there were a lot of other projects going on during the last decade um, so we, they did, these firms did have to manage the incredibly large amount of scope that they had to do for the Ecowater project, along with their other uh, projects that they had. So I think if we just hired, say, Corolla, which they did an amazing job, did several um, key projects for the Ecowater project, if they had them all, for example, they wouldn't be able to work anywhere else. Um, so I think we maxed out a lot of design firms, Todd. So we had to diversify to make sure we we could fit those designs for their availability in for when we needed them to be designed and constructed to meet our permit compliance. So I think our permit compliance deadlines played a major role in the number of design firms and when we needed to bring them on board and get them completed. Okay, so it sounds like you know the, the two biggest things are the, the, the size of this, this project and how many groups were involved in, in managing all these different groups. How are some of those um, obstacles overcome? We've, we've talked a little bit about this. But maybe you can go into some more details. They were overcome by the PMO and the regional sanitation district, specifically uh, the Echo Water members of that, uh, Vic Kiyotani, the, the program manager, um, Dan Wilson, who was the integration manager for all the integrations. Um, we recommended that they use um, back in 2014 synchro to manage the design and construction we had already uh had a 3d model of all the existing underground utilities so what we did is we placed all the new underground utilities with the new designs above ground um, on top of that um, so it was a perfect fit to introduce synchro and so uh we provided a white paper that was going to test the um, the validity of that of that program or that project, yeah, the program, the synchro program. And we had some early wins. For so, for example, uh, the BNR project, the biological nutrient removal project, it's a massive uh, facility that's at the heart of the new tertiary treatment facility, the Ecowater project. It's 18 football fields. It had a very specific um, poor uh, requirement in their specifications and their design. Um, so we had to test to make sure that the design and the construction schedule that uh, was produced by the designer was buildable within the time frame and just buildable in general. Um, so we used that as one of our first uh, practices to see if the synchro project 
or the Synchro platform was going to work, and it did. Um, they found an issue within the first 30 seconds of us playing it for the first time in 2024. And that gave us enough momentum to continue to implement it for a decade. Um, so the implementation of the Synchro project early on during the planning played a huge role throughout the entire life cycle of the Echo Water project for a decade. Um, and then that turned into, as you can imagine, we're a very big client uh, for Bentley. So they worked hand in hand and we grew together. Uh, their software grew to meet the demands of their largest project that they had in the United States, which was ours, to basically develop and the evolution of what we now call the digital twin or what Bentley calls the iTwin. So that was developed on the Echo Water project. A lot of it was. Uh, for a decade. And during that process, what was amazing to discover is the client actually drove the evolution. They said to us, hey, can we make the digital twin do this? Can we have a master operational blackout, shutdown, cut over uh, schedule that's visual that we can use to make sure we don't turn off any processes that would you know, have a negative impact on the facility? And we did, we went back to Bentley. They create, they helped us create that and we implement that and it worked really well. And that kind of thing grew um, for, for a decade. So our biggest challenge was to figure out um, how we are going to stagger, how we we're going to separate each of these projects into their own individual projects, when would they were going to be out to bid, when they were going to be completed, when we we're going to cut those over and then have a master operational commissioning schedule that commissions the entire project. It was such a big program that none of this was possible just by using a Gantt chart. And these amazing people that we worked with, they realized that and they really, um, they really used the digital twin and the synchro platform to plan their work, make sure that they are creating, um, that they are, um, making proactive decisions instead of reactive decisions because we're able to provide that situational awareness to them to help them to make those decisions. Um, so there's obviously a lot going on in this project and you you probably tried to plan as much for every kind of contingency, but what were maybe one or two things on this project that was actually a, kind of a big surprise, either, either good or bad that, that, that nobody really saw coming? You know, there was nothing bad. Um, and the reason that is, is because we were able to... Um, reduce the risk of all well, when we got when we received um the construction schedules which was the construction schedules from the designers and the contractors construction schedules we were able to reduce the risk <clears throat> before they ever occurred in the field so that was by design with the with the uh, i twin and the synchro platform so you know there was nothing really that occurred on this project that was a big negative surprise. Um, some things that were positive are the fact that the client was were the drivers of the the evolution of the digital twin. I think that was a big deal. Um, and the other thing was um, the client came to us and said, "Hey, we are receiving schedules from these contractors that um, we could tell they're not going to be able to meet their their deadlines." Um, then the reason that we could tell is because for many of the projects, we we basically synchronized them into the federated digital twin ourselves. So we had better situational awareness than the contractor did. And our client, uh, the regional sanitation district, they said, you know, I'm tired of having better situational awareness than the contractor. I would like you guys to require the contractor to use the software to provide us a better plan and manage their construction project better. So they told us to implement the requirement that the contractor use the Synchro for their baseline schedule and for all of their pro progress updates. So uh, for the BNR project, uh, we noticed that they could not keep up with their, with their construction schedule. Even after nine months of them um, planning their schedule and then providing us that schedule, when we reviewed it, it was just not buildable. 
Um, they were basically leaving the entire, remember it's 18 football fields and they were exiting the entire facility before they had cranes that could reach, you know, all the way into the center. And it's really not the fault of the contract. It was just so complex that it was impossible to see in a Gantt chart. So um, we were able to see these issues. We, we showed them to the contractor after nine months and they said, oh, we can't build it like that. And we worked with them to redesign their baseline schedule to make sure it's buildable. So based on that, um, the, the last big project, the tertiary treatment facility, the TTF, they had the requirement to use Synchro and it was a game changer. They had the quickest um, baseline schedule approved. They never fell behind schedule. They made a great profit on their project, even though it was, it was a design bid build. Um, and they always caught any of the issues before they provided us their update every single month. So by the time we got their synchro project, which was required by contract, they had fixed all the issues. They had cleared all the interferences with any other contractor. And they had a great plan that they used in the field to visualize their construction project. So that was a big surprise. And I think that Todd is the future of these major programs because they're just getting too complex to use with old school technologies. So what did you say that you would you learn from this project as a designer engineer and that you might be able to incorporate into your future work to, uh, to do things better? Water treatment projects that are coming online today are just way too complex to use with technology that was developed in the 50s. We need to evolve. We need to use the current generation of technology, which is artificial intelligence, which is the iTwin. We need to use Bentley Synchro platform to make sure that we are delivering these projects that are on time and on budget. And one thing I did not say is because we use Bentley's uh, digital construction solution through, through the life cycle of the Echo Water project, our original budget was $2.1 billion. And we came in just under $1.7 billion total at completion. And we finished on time, met all of our permit compliance deadlines. So we finished over $400 million under budget. Um, and because of those savings, because we've used this, the D Bentley's Digital Twin as a great example of its success on a major program, that's the future. I think every pro project in the future, every major program needs to use this if they want to be successful. Another testament to that is the savings. The $400 million savings went on to fund a whole nother program for the regional sanitation called the Harvest Water Program. And what that's doing is that's providing recycled water, the largest recycling water project in California to date, to the Central Valley agricultural industry which is a massive industry. And in the next 15 years, due to the Harvest Water Project, we're gonna raise the groundwater by 35 feet. Right now, we are using a ton of groundwater. Um, the Central Valley is sinking, and we're going to replenish all of that groundwater with the Harvest Water Project, provide a sustainable solution for re recycled water, and at no extra cost to the ratepayers because we saved them $400 million. So the future programs that are out there should use Echo Water as a legacy project of what the benefits are of using the digital iTwin, Bentley's digital construction solution. And they should use that going forward into the next decade. Okay, is there something specific that, that you think you will do differently on, on current or future work that you learned from this project that, that you're now going to take and and in a different direction than, than you would have had, had you not worked on this project at all? Well, having worked on this project, it really opened my mind to what the benefit uh, is of working with some extremely brilliant people. So what needs to be understood is that the fact that we were able to use the digital, Bentley's digital construction solution is because the people who are, the, are our leaders at the Echo Water Project, Vic Kiyotani, um, the three uh, program advisors, which was Pervez Anwar, uh, Bob Vilker, and Graham Calciano, the three of them had 
um, the incredible intelligence, but also the foresight into recognizing that they need to leverage technology. And I would hope that other projects in the future, other programs, they do the same thing. They recognize that they need to leverage that technology and not revert back to revert back to the old way of doing things, which, you know, over we all know it's just, you know, you finish you know, over budget, not on time. It's just not a very good way to do it. So um, what we are going to do is we're going to use the echo, the success of the Echo Water project as a stepping stone to the next generation and to continue to evolve the iTwin implementing AI technology so that it's even more efficient. It does an even better job to make sure that the next programs that we work on finish on time and under budget, which should be the future of all programs. Hi, I'm Sorrel Korn and I'm the managing member at Project Controls Cubes. And my background is actually that I'm a licensed architect and I got my architecture degree at University of Southern California. So I first started as a designer um, in architecture and that's on airports actually. And then I just somehow jumped onto water projects and I started working with construction management and I became um, what I do now, like a scheduler. So I've been doing, I've been in construction for, gosh, maybe 16 years or so. But yeah, I've been in this industry and I love what I do. Okay, so how would you describe um, the Echo Water Project? I know you heard about what, what, what Jeff said, but might be some other details that you could add what makes it special and unique from, from your perspective, perhaps. Well, first of all, what I think is awesome about the Echo Water Project is it is unheard of to have finished on time with $400 million in savings. Everybody is usually used to, you know, project being delayed and you go over budget, but yeah, it's a testament of, I think everybody on this project as well as just, I mean, this project is awesome. And I think not only that, but that we saved a bunch of money, but also the good that it does for the environment. So I don't know if you know, but you know, this project, it actually clean, it, we had started with a secondary um, level of cleanliness, you know, so there's a secondary and then there's a permit that required to do a tertiary, right, treatment. The tertiary just made the water even cleaner, right? Close to, I wouldn't drink it, but close to drinking water, right? And so what that did was that it made it so that it removed 99% ammonia, 89% of the nitrates from the water, which means that you have cleaner water going back into the Delta. The Delta feeds, right? All of the Central Valley harvest, all the food you eat, you drive up the five, all that agriculture you see, the water is feeding all that, as well as the drinking water to 25 million people in Sac County, Sacramento County. So, I mean, this project was, it just, really benefited just the environment. We all know where California is with our issue with drought, right? So this is the kind of water projects that really, we really need to give, make the water go out and I guess just keep it also all within, right? And we reuse the water. With all that kind of um, budget savings, I would think that there would have been a lot of you know fixed costs just on, on, on materials and things. So how much money was able to be saved? Was that with the, the technology, the modeling, the, the management, or or just uh, the, the efforts of the people involved? I think you like checked all the boxes. So it was a combination, but we have to start with the leadership and the management on this project was just exceptional. I would say everybody on here from like the managers to the, um, sorry, to the engineers, the designers, the construction, the CM team, just everybody, I think we had the A team, okay? And it was also the mindset of our managers that they they thought, you know what, this project is complex. This project has all these intricacies, all these inner project coordinations. This is a big deal. You know, we need to have some kind of robust engine here that can manage this. What tools can help us manage this? And they looked into technology and that's very rare. I'm going to tell you that Todd, like most people think technology and bringing on things like a 45D and, you know, you know, going to that area arena, that means dollar signs, right? But what the management sought was savings of dollar signs. And we've been on tons of projects and programs. And that's why I think this team was special. The PMO 
not to mention we're just like a family there. We, I think we all thought and had the big picture in mind. We wanted success and we wanted to save money. We had a successful project that finishes on time, but we also wanted to save the rate payers that money, right? And what are those means, the venue, in order to do that? All right, so how about your take on some of the difficulties of such a large project? And, and how did it compare to, to any other project that you've had? Like how much larger was this in scope than, than, than most of your previous work? A lot of ways, a lot of the projects we work on are massive. This project though was like a mega project. It was 22 projects and a lot of them happening simultaneously. And the kicker was that it's on an existing um, plant. So we need to make sure that nothing is being, none of the processes are being disrupted. Um, so the big issue is we have a bunch of projects occurring at the same time. We have contractors like sharing in the same area, you know, sometimes there would be three overlapping, right? And the difficulty, not just from on the field, right? But also as a program, right? You need to schedule all these designs and the contractors, the con you know, everything, you need to make sure that it's planned out, you know, to a sequence that we don't delay others, right? All the inner project coordinations and whatnot. I mean, sometimes, like I said, there'd be three contractors in one area. And they're sharing just like a six foot alley, right? And you need to just be very mindful that you don't put in equipment there. You don't have a travel area there that everybody is very cognizant of that, right? So that's where the synchro model or the 5D, 4D, 5D really was beneficial is because you could see those touch points, right? So in a schedule, right? We have a program schedule, it's all in P6, right? So those are just lines of activities, but you don't really understand you don't understand the touch points of the, the actual sequence of construction occurring in the field. You can't put a crane there. If you put a crane there, then the other mm -hmm. contractor can't access it. Oh, you can't put a crane there because then your concrete pump trucks also can't get there, you know, to pump that concrete. It's, or you can't drop that massive pipe right there. So that 5D tool that we were able to use, it really was beneficial for everybody to see and study live you know what's occurring in the field as well as well as all like the shutdowns and cutovers the tie-ins because again this is an existing plant so we need to be able to understand those constraints seasonal as well as operational all right so so we didn't get to talk with jeff too much about the the problems of having the existing plant can you maybe talk about those a little bit since we haven't covered it oh sure yeah so being on an existing plant like i said there are there are issues that you have to be very cognizant about, such as um, you have to make sure that it is, the plant is continuously running um, to process, right? To be able to process water um, during times of high flows, low flows. So those are seasonal constraints, right? As well as you have to make sure that there are environmental constraints that you abide to, right? So, um, you can't just shut down a part of the plant or where's all the poopy water going to go? You know, you have to make sure that you have a certain amount of the plant to be processes, processing um, X many capacity, right? Um, to make sure that it doesn't overflow or get pushed into a delta, or you don't want any raw sewage going into any kind of environmental area. Yes. So that was um, important when we were studying, like I said, the cutovers and tie-ins. Because again, this project, we're dropping in, installing new large pipes, right? Influent, effluent, as well as bringing new processes online, like the BNR, which is um, processing the poopy water, right? And the, and the nitrogen, taking the ammonias and the nitrates out and all that. But in order to get those online, right? You have to tap into the existing plant. So again, using the 5D, we studied that. So every time there was a shutdown, that was necessary, or we need to keep um, a process online, we would show that in our model. And then we would also run that model by the ONM, the operation and maintenance staff, to make sure they're on board and they understand what is occurring out there in the field. It was a really good platform for all stakeholders to be able to visualize, see what's going in and have their input. So I believe that was also very vital in the success of our project. 